The cold, cold winter has given me a cold. And if I can smell, I travel through my wine memories. That means it's the perfect time for me to talk about my wines of 2023. The good, the bad and the ugly, or rather the wines I remember. Do you remember the wines? Well, let's go. 2023 has been a good year for me as I've tasted thousands of wines. On my mission to make the world taste better, I've traveled to California, Georgia, several times to France and Italy, and of course the growing regions of Germany, and believe it or not, England. There's no chance that I can talk about all these experiences here, so I'm going to focus on the ones that really stood out, mostly because they were good. There were many bangers amongst the wines that I've tasted, cult wines or unicorn wines that are really hard to get, but I'm going to mix in quite a few wines that are affordable or easier to purchase to make it more interesting for you. This is not all though. At the end, I'm also going to share which bottles I'm going to open in 2024. So let's dive in. So let's start with Champagne, as you do. And this is the 2006 Pierre Moncuy Grand Cru Blanc de Blanc Champagne which just blew me away. This wine clearly shows that you don't always need to buy the big brands, the Grand Marc, because this is a more, well, smaller label that hasn't the same production and marketing machinery behind it. But the wines are delicious. And this one in particular was extremely complex, multi-layered, and it lasted for quite a while. And the interesting thing about this wine was after tasting it over and over, it lost quite a bit of its CO2, but it still tasted delicious. And that's a very good sign. By the way, a good way of keeping sparkling wine is to use the Coravin sparkling. You basically just add a thing, a closure on top and pump some CO2 into the bottle. And the wine just keeps its freshness for longer. This is not sponsored at all. It's just something that I've used quite a bit this year. So let's move on to the next one. And this was actually one of the most affordable wines in the tasting. It's the 2022 L'Altro Lange Chardonnay from Pio Cesare. I mean, Chardonnay from Piedmont is not a huge thing, I would say, but it's becoming more and more popular down there, but also, for example, in Germany and many other markets in Europe. Chardonnay from Burgundy is getting really, really expensive. And there are others that are trying to do something with a grape variety in different markets all around the world. I really found this wine outstanding just because it had this salinity, this gracious, very elegant fruit flavor and this beautiful length on the palate. I retasted it a few times after the video that I did on this one and some other wines and it just kept together really, really well. And after a few days, it was still beautiful and really fresh. This showed to me that there is potential for Chardonnay in Piedmont. I just don't think they should focus too much on it. I think it's great that they made this wine, but come on, just focus on Nebbiolo, Barbera, Dolcetto and so on. That's that's this, that's really the stuff the world needs. Next up, we have the 2010 Praga Achleiten Grüner Feldliner Stockkultur from Austria. I did taste this wine in the Jancis Robinson comparison where I blind tasted against her ratings. And this was just so delicious. It's such a deep and complex and really exciting wine. I think I rated it 97 points, which is a high score, but this wine deserved it. And it kind of reminded me that I should try more Grüner Feldliner. The grape variety was super popular in the 90s, as far as I can remember, maybe even the early 2000s, but it's not as important anymore, as relevant for whatever reason. Maybe that's just my impression, but Grüner Feldliner can produce amazing wines if handled this well. A wine that changed my perspective on how white wine should taste was the 2012 Vina Tondonia Reserva Blanco, which was just so good. You know, in my mind, usually white wine needs to have quite a lot of freshness and zing in order to be really good. I drink white wine to be refreshed. And I think it's an important part of every great white wine, even the bigger ones should have quite a bit of acidity in order to lift it and 
Uh, just make the wine more interesting. With the Vina Tononia, I found that the acidity is actually not what carries it. It's the texture, the grip, the richness, the intensity, but at the same time, also liveliness on the palate. Liveliness not through acidity, but rather through the overall texture. It was just so complex on the nose and I really... I can still taste it right now, even though my nose is blocked, but I can taste it. Delicious wine. Let me see whether I can actually still get a whiff out of this bottle. I think it was sealed since I emptied the bottle, so let's, let's, let's smell. Mm. Even the empty bottle is delicious. It smells like, like a coleta port, a tawny port, something like that. Oh. Really delicious. Another wine that plays at the other end of the spectrum is the Tyrrell's Vat One Semillon from 1998. This wine clearly breaks with quite a lot of preconceived notions, like for example that Australian wines always have to be big and rich. This is really light in alcohol, 10.5% and very acidic and fresh. The other one would be that white wines shouldn't be aged. This one was actually still so fresh after 25 years of aging that it, it felt like it barely started maturing. And the last preconceived notion would be that wine filled into milk bottles can't be good. I mean, this bottle is just too much. But, well, who cares if the wine tastes like that? This wine was actually one of the great wines I've tasted at this year's Master of Wine Symposium. An amazing event where people from all around the world come together to talk about wine and taste wine. So it is very, very nerdy, but it was amazing. And this, one of the standout wines. So we can't do one of those without a Riesling. I actually looked at the list of outstanding wines I've tasted this year. And there were quite a few Rieslings in that list, so I had to be quite selective. And this is, yeah, it is a wine that is very difficult to get. So you can look it up, but but um, if you find a bottle, it's going to be expensive. But it was just delicious. The 2017 Keller Pettenthal Riesling was one of the best Rieslings I've tasted this year. And, well, Keller probably would feature in quite a lot of those best wines of the year videos if I do them every year. So delicious stuff. I think what makes this wine so special is that they are just very concentrated, very expressive, but at the same time, there's so much balance there. And it's just oftentimes the essence of the grape variety and the place, which Sounds a little bit cheesy, but but it's it's true. You might wonder why I still have all those empty bottles. I think this tasting was quite a few months ago. And the answer is I collect bottles. It's an issue. Next up, we have a wine that opened my eyes to the ageability of one of the most famous and common grape varieties in the world, Sauvignon Blanc. This is the 1997 Lantrat Guyolo La Rambat from Puy Fumé in Centre Loire. And well, the reason why the bottle isn't empty is because I took some wine out with my Coravin. And the thing that makes this wine special to me is that it's a Sauvignon Blanc and it's more than 25 years of age and it's still delicious. Sauvignon Blanc is one of those grape varieties where people think you can't really age it, you should drink it straight away. But that's not always the case. Some of these wines can age really, really well and they become more interesting and exciting after a few years in bottle. This is one of the oldest Puy Fumés I've ever tasted and the wine still showed really, really well. There was a bit of bottle variation, so some bottles were better than others. But if you got a good bottle, it was really, really good. Next up, we have the 2022 Patats Fontaine Montague Stain from South Africa. You know that I'm trying to further my knowledge about South African wines. So I'm actually importing this producer into Germany. I have this unwritten rule that I never review wines on my YouTube channel that I also sell. I'm not selling this wine because it's not available. I would have loved to buy some of it, 
but I just couldn't get it. But this just was the essence of Chenin Blanc from South Africa, in my opinion. It's a delicious wine with lots of crisp, ripe and bruised apple notes, some waxy notes, some lanolin, some wild wet wool character as well. On the palate, it's just super fresh with great concentration and just amazing balance. I again didn't make it to South Africa this year, even though I had some opportunities, but it just didn't work out. But this is one of those wines that makes me want to go there. Maybe next year. Next up, we have the Matsunotsukasa Kimoto Junmai. Not a wine, a sake. So, well, technically it's a wine. It's a rice wine. I spent some time this year learning about sake production, which was absolutely fascinating. It's a completely different kind of world, but one that I really want to explore more. So sake, much like wine, is based on one main ingredient. But there are lots of differences in the production process. It's not as easy as wine where you just press grapes, get grape juice and let it ferment. Here you actually have to make sure that you release the starch or the sugars in the rice in order to turn it into alcohol. So I, I don't feel very comfortable talking too much about it because it is tricky and I haven't explored it enough. But But I'm gone. This was one of the sakes I tasted and I really liked it. It was very classic, much like water, very elegant, soft, and still there was more there. There was concentration and depth. There were flavors that you kind of had to get out of the glass first. And there clearly is quite a lot of history and culture associated with sake. And look at this bottle. It's just so beautiful. Even though I don't know at all what it says on here, it could say I hate Konstantin Baum and I just endorse this product, but I, I hope it doesn't. It, uh, I, I'm pretty sure it doesn't. So now we're moving into red wine territory and here I have the 2021 Bernhard Huber Schlossberg from, from Germany, from the Kaiserstuhl. It's a großes Gewächs. It's a very, very delicious red wine very complex wine with lots of layers and even though it's still very young it showed lots of promise. I'm more and more convinced of the quality of German Pinot Noir. I think there are so many great producers out there right now. The wines are getting more expensive but most of them are still fairly affordable at least when it comes to Pinot things easily get really really expensive so German Pinot still can be a bargain and wines like this just yeah they, they're just delicious they are amazing they are really high end and they can can play with the best you know they're at the same level as some of the best wines from burgundy i have to add one wine of which i don't have the bottle but i have a picture on my phone it's the 2019 pinot noir from monti e okaido a Japanese Pinot that didn't really taste much like a Pinot from Burgundy, where Montille is from, or Etienne Montille is from, who's involved in this project. It is very pale in color. It smells of strawberries and it's very fragrant and soft and elegant. And it's quite juicy and light on the palate as well. Not a wine of structure, but a wine of beauty. And it just highlighted to me that there's just so much more to discover in the world of wine. Japanese wine is certainly not something most people have on their radar. Maybe it will never pan out, but there's potential there to turn Japan into an interesting winemaking country as well, maybe at some point in the future. So the wine world continues to grow and it continues to amaze me. Next up, we have a full bottle and it kind of represents a region that I traveled to this year where I really loved the wines and kind of fell back in love with Sangiovese. It was Vino Nobile de Montepulciano. I'm actually going to bring out a video on this region on my trip there. I tasted quite a few different Vino Nobiles, which are based on Sangiovese in Purezza. And 
I really like them. They are so fresh and fragrant and lively. And there's quite a lot of chew to them as well. Boscarelli, for me personally, is one of the best, if not the best, because it combines this chewiness, this edgy and tannic structure, the acidity with nice body and juiciness. And it's just, it's just delicious. This is actually the Il Nocho, a wine from a single vineyard which has been in the family for a long time and produces really outstanding grapes and therefore really good wine. Next, we have the 2019 Dan Vineyards Cabernet Sauvignon from Napa from Howell Mountains. I actually tasted this very recently in my Wine Spectator Top 10 video, but I just really, really like the wines. Napa Valley Cabernet Sauvignons often get lots of complaints. The wines tend to be fairly expensive and sometimes they are really rich and powerful, maybe too rich and too powerful. But when they made right, then they are just delicious. They are, there's a reason why these wines are so expensive. Usually it's because there's high demand for them because this style is just delicious. Here done, they also focus on balance. There's not just body there, there's also freshness and tannic structure. And while the wines are accessible fairly early on, they can also mature for a long time. This bottle stayed open for a few days in my cellar and I tasted and retasted it and just enjoyed it. However, if you're thinking about opening this right now, then pour it into a carafe in order to give it a little bit of air so that it can express itself fully. But don't open it right now. Just keep it. Don't be as stupid as me. Keep it for 10 years at least. And here we go. This was just a delicious treat. The 2010 Ponte Canet from Poyac in Bordeaux. I think this wine was rated 100 points by Robert Parker. So I tasted it in the Robert Parker tasting video, which did really well. So thank you for that. And yeah, I, I, I just really like this wine. Um, it's one of those Bordeaux that definitely deliver on a very high level. And it's not crazy in terms of pricing. It's very expensive, but you can still afford it if you kind of save up a few euros or dollars in order to purchase it. I think there's quite a lot of love for Ponte Canet, which might be because Alfred Tesseron, the owner, is a great guy. Maybe because they've really pioneered organics and biodynamics in Bordeaux. Maybe it's just because the wines are great. I actually did a photo post on Instagram with a bottle of Ponte Canet, not the 2010, but the 2016 vintage. And I think it was the most liked post on my Instagram page, whatever that really means. The likes certainly didn't pour in because of this, you know, it, it was because of this. One of the best sweet wines I've tasted, and this is not an unknown label, it's the 2020 Egon Müller Schatzhofberger Kabinett Riesling from the Saar. I actually tasted a few different wines from Egon Müller this year and all of them were outstanding, which goes to show that some hype wines are really worth the hype. There's a reason why these wines are so expensive. I mean, the quality is just on another level. That said, the cabinet is actually not that expensive, but some of the really sweet wines, they can be very, very expensive. This year, I also went to a panel discussion with Egon Müller and Jancis Robinson. And some people might be surprised, but he can be a really funny guy, very entertaining. On the pictures, he doesn't appear to be that outgoing. But yeah, he's he's an interesting, very thoughtful man. And he has some humor. I mean, he's he's German, so in the context of him being a German, he's he's pretty funny. So last but not least, I have this, the 1861 Burmester Alto Duro Tordis Ultra Reserva. This was a total surprise when I opened it because the quality of the cork and the level in the bottle was terrible, but the wine just stood up and was still there. It was still really, really good. I definitely still enjoyed it. I shared it with quite a lot of different people and there's still some left here though. Maybe, maybe I just give it another taste. Shall I? Yeah, I shall. Okay.
Okay, this glass is a little bit dirty, but anyways. Still delicious. And this is after it being open in bottle for a few months now. So I'm just going to keep this for 2024. So this was my wines of the year 2023, but I'm also going to tell you which wines I'm going to open next year. So let's let's do this. Every year I go through my cellar in order to pick out the wines that I have to drink soon, otherwise they might go bad. And this is a small selection of the wines that I definitely want to drink in 2024. So here we have the 2013 Kopp Spätburgunder Sonnenberg, which is a wine that I actually tasted in a wine competition and I really loved it. And it happened to win that competition, a delicious Pinot. And I think it's it's now time to pop the cork. I only have that one bottle left that I found somewhere in some shop in some place in Germany. And yeah, in 2024, I'm going to drink this with somebody. Next up, we have the 2021 Chateau de Fusal Pessac Léonion Blanc, a white Bordeaux, not necessarily a wine that ages super well. And I'm kind of, I, I, I think I might have actually already missed the point when I should have opened this. I mean, looking at the wine through the glass, it still seems to be okay when it comes to the color. So, yeah, but I definitely shouldn't risk keeping it for any longer. Next, we have the 2004 Corton Charmagne Grand Cru from Domaine Maratre Dubreuil in Burgundy, a white Burgundy from the 2000s. Mm, quite a lot of white wines from Burgundy during that period around the millennium had this issue, which is now known as Premox, premature oxidation so they turned into vinegar brown and disgusting pretty early on because of deficiencies in the vineyard winemaking practices that weren't really adjusted to the conditions and the quality of the grapes and this was an issue during that period so maybe this is just trash now so this might be trash expensive trash and last but not least I think we all have these bottles in our cellar that are kind of special to us for whatever reason and we just don't want to open them, but we should. This is the 1996 Chapoutier Hermitage de Lauré, a white wine from the hill of Hermitage, a wine that I've been wanting to try for many years now. And I keep pushing it off. I always kind of go, well, this is not the right occasion. Those people will not understand this wine. They might like to taste something completely different. The risk is too high to open this bottle now because I don't, I don't want to serve bad wine to them. So this year, well, next year, I'm just going to pop the cork here. I have to. This might be past its peak. I mean, it's 1996, so it's close to 30 years old now. And those wines, they can age, but they don't always age. And the level is getting lower and lower. So, so I definitely need to taste this. There are also three wine styles that I definitely want to taste in 2024. The first one is this, Buckfast. You know, you always have to continue educating yourself even if you don't always put the best stuff into your body but you you need to understand what's going on in the world of wine and buckfast is certainly a wine style that is special it is a traditional drink made by the benedictine monks of the buckfast abbey in devon england and they describe it as a red wine based aperitif with high caffeine content i've been told that it is a party drink in the uk it has 15% of alcohol and it has caffeine, so it's a little bit like the vodka Red Bull before vodka Red Bull. Last but not least, we have two wine styles that represent two different grape varieties that I want to taste more of in 2024. One is Syrah. I love Syrah. There's so much great Syrah in the wine world, but I don't drink enough of it. So I definitely want to taste more Syrah and explore what's going on in that world right now. The other one is Cabernet Franc. So this is this weird bottle is a Chinon 
And Chinon is obviously based on Cabernet Franc. I hear more and more things about Cabernet Franc where people start using more of it all around the world from Italy to California and everything in between. So I want to taste more Cabernet Francs and kind of really understand what this grape variety is all about. All right, this was my 2023 review and 2024 outlook. I certainly couldn't cover every wine style that I enjoyed this year. There were so many more, but at least you get a bit of an overview on what's going on in my head. Not that you really want to see that. But anyways, I hope you had a great year as well. I really enjoyed 2023. I really enjoyed what's going on on this channel. So thank you all for contributing, for sharing your opinions and just watching the videos. My question of the day obviously has to be, what is your greatest wine moment of 2023? Let me know down below. I hope I see you guys again very soon. Until then, stay thirsty.